even outside of blockchain data, indexing, when we talk about, say, library index cards or what you do with Google search and how they index other websites. It's really this process of taking an existing data set, books, websites, blockchain data, digesting that and making it more usable. So it could be, you wanna make it searchable, you wanna make it useful for your product, whatever it might be, indexing is that process of, of digesting it. And so then for blockchains, this becomes, uh, Indexing the data is taking all those, those breadcrumbs, the receipts, the transactions, pulling it all together, decoding it, uh, and then trying to make sense of it in a usable way. And this, this compounds, as you were alluding to, just gets even crazier when you start adding in multiple blockchains or you have data that's on-chain and off-chain and trying to merge all that together in a useful way is, is really difficult. Style podcast. GM, GM, this is Aperture with another DSXDAO podcast. And in this episode, we have the indexing company and specifically Brock from the indexing company as our guest. Uh, we're going to go over what data actually is in the blockchain space and how important that will be in the future, uh, especially with all these different chains uh, and all these different types of chains, um, cross-chain activity, different analytics apps. So it will be an important episode to um, to listen to. Uh, but we've, before we go into deep and also learn more about what the indexing company does and how they serve their, their customers, um, I want to invite Brock uh, to say hello and maybe do an intro himself. Um, I think what I would like to hear from you is like, how did you enter the crypto space and uh, why did you decide to start the indexing company? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me, first of all. Yeah, excited to be here. Um, so yeah, my, Brock, as you, as you mentioned, I've been an engineer generally for about a decade now. Uh, a lot of contracting, a lot of small scale startups, um, very familiar with building digital products. Uh, and along the way, this was back in 2016, I think it was, um, basically bored one night, dabbling with software, kind of building, heard about Bitcoin, heard about Ethereum, ended up on an Ethereum job board where I met my now co-founder. Um, he was doing real estate on chain, past company, uh, needed some help with that. I jumped in. Um, and so starting in 2017, I was indexing on-chain data and merging it with off-chain data. So we're trying to do something sort of like a, a Zillow type interface uh, where real estate agents would come in, curate listings on-chain, um, but they're still pulling in that off-chain data as well. Uh, so yeah, so Stephen and I ran that for several years. I ended up at Coinbase after that for a year and a half. Uh, and then fast forwarding now to summer 2022, uh, Steven and I got back together. We wanted to build something else in the Web3 space. We uh, were kind of hooked, I guess you could say. And we realized to build any other products, we'd still have to build the same infrastructure. We would have to go out to the blockchains, build the infrastructure to get the data ourselves. Um, I always kind of thought it was crazy. We were like, okay, it's been five, six years now. Why do we still have to build the same stuff? Uh, and so this is where the indexing company came in. We just want to be synonymous with, with that infrastructure, that pipeline, uh, and really empower other businesses to build better products. That's actually funny because you now are building, again, the same same infrastructure, but at least helping other teams with, um, with building that and not having to go through that trouble yourself and not make the same mistakes as you, you did in the past. Um, before we go deeper into the indexing company and what they do, I, I think we, we should uh, inform the listener a little bit more about what data is actually available on the blockchain um, and what is, is indexing. 
Uh, so could you come up with some like definitions and make it a little bit more visual for the listener? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll add a disclaimer. These are just my own definition. So I'll tell you with the grain of salt, but uh, I guess starting with blockchain data, if you think of the blockchain as a distributed ledger, what that really means is it's almost a, a giant shared bank account, if you will. So when you go and you log into your Chase account or your US bank account, whatever it is, you're looking at all your transactions in there. You're going to see things like the vendor, how much you paid, the date, um, what account you paid with, maybe you used a credit card, whatever it is, you're going to see all that information in there, sort of a receipt of your transaction, right? That's essentially what ends up on chain as well. You're using a wallet, you're paying with crypto. There is a monetary transfer of some sort. Um, and so that is at the core what blockchain data really is. On top of that, especially in more modern blockchains, i.e. Ethereum, we now have a way to have programmable money. And so what that really means is there's software that's running behind the scenes. And that software, when it gets ran, it leaves little breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs on chain. These come in the form of large traces. Uh, and what those really are is, is little indicators on chain saying, hey, this event happened. Somebody transferred this amount of crypto to somebody else, whatever it might be. Uh, so kind of summing all that up, what ends up on chain is really just markers to what happened. It's little indicators. It's not necessarily the full picture, but little, little bits of information that if you put it all together, you can get a much better picture. So switching gears then to indexing, even outside of blockchain data, indexing, when we talk about say library index cards or what you do with Google search and how they index other websites, it's really this process of taking an existing data set, books, websites, blockchain data, digesting that and making it more usable. So it could be, you wanna make it searchable, you wanna make it useful for your product, whatever it might be, indexing is that process of, of digesting it. And so then for blockchains, this becomes uh, indexing the data is taking all those, those breadcrumbs, the receipts, the transactions, pulling it all together, decoding it, uh, and then trying to make sense of it in a usable way. And this, this compounds, as you were alluding to, just gets even crazier when you start adding in multiple blockchains or you have data that's on chain and off chain and trying to merge all that together in a useful way is, is really difficult. Yeah, and I think um, one of the problems if I do like on chain analysis is uh, as you described it, it, it sounds actually quite structured, but it, it hardly ever is uh, because uh, the traces you mentioned, it can be one trace, it can be 10 traces. And um, the, the good thing for the space is that these transactions and uh, the applications, the dApps being, being um, built on the blockchain are getting more complex. And um, that's great for a user because there's less clicks, less, less actions, but that makes the data more and more unstructured over time. So um, I think that's that's also a, a problem that's important that is being solved, but it, it is also like an, a never ending problem yeah. Uh, here. Yeah, nobody, uh, there's no great standards to be honest. Uh, there's, a, there's a few that are widely adopted, but other than that, everybody seems to be trying to create their own standards, which just means nobody has a standard. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think, the reality of, of being early. Uh, hopefully, yes. we will see some standards. And I think there are some standards, but that's mostly because people are forking protocols. So that's, yep. you know, just the same standard. Um, um, but, yeah, I think eventually we will see some, some winners on that. But uh, for now, it's uh, fairly a wild west. Um, and and does this... this um, this definition of, of data uh, also like cover indexing or is, is like, I think I see indexing more as an, um, an action to, to get that data. Uh, what, what would your like definition of, of indexing be and like what actions would uh, be needed to pull and read data from a blockchain? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think indexing, especially in Web3 has been put in a smaller 
bucket as just uh, kind of what you're alluding to, like just reading data off chain and putting it into a database. So somebody was like making an API or an RPC call, whatever data they get back, they chuck it in a database and they worry about it later. And they call that indexing. Um, I think for us, it's a much more holistic problem space where we're going out, we're fetching the data. So there's that extraction piece um, and that might be on chain, that might be off chain, there could be hybrid approaches. You're basically going out and getting the data where it exists. Uh, and then on top of that, you have to do transformations. So you're modifying this data in some way. It could be that you're merging data from multiple blockchains. It could be that you're running aggregation pipelines on it. Uh, you're doing some sort of work on that data itself prior to then delivering it uh, into a database or some other data warehouse that makes sense for where it needs to be used. Uh, and so the real goal then is not just to have a replica of what's on chain, but to have something augmented that's useful for your use case. And that, that's kind of what we call indexing there is, is that action of getting usable data. Yeah, I, and that's, I think, maybe something you're battling against that, you know, indexing the definition in the classic sense of just pulling data and that's it, yep. um, is is that, like, that's being done uh, already. Um, but doing these other transformations to actually make the data usable or aggre uh, aggregating or combining that with off-chain data, um, I think that's one of the newer um, uh, applications and needs um, for for builders and, and companies. So I think that brings us to to the question, um, like what what solutions are there right now? And um, I I think I also want to note that there isn't one perfect solution. Like yep. uh, different data needs from different companies and and or single users. Uh, but like, how does this space look like in, in terms of solutions or uh, products people can use? Yeah, and I, obviously this is coming from a very biased take. So take that uh, for what it's worth. Um, but the, the way we see the landscape right now is the existing solutions are essentially doing some flavor of data reselling. So you look at the alchemies, the graphs of the world's um, covalent, they're going out, grabbing data off chain, putting it into their own internal data sources. So it could be databases, data warehouses, whatever they have internally, and then reselling that in various ways. So they're selling API access, they're selling database mirroring. Uh, and what this really means as a consumer of that data, you're left uh, just choosing between providers that are telling you what they have to offer, as in uh, Covalent might have more NFT related data already predefined. Alchemy might have more ERC-20 data uh, defined, whatever it might be, they've predefined these data sets. And so as a consumer, you're, you're kind of just looking at their existing menu of options, if you will. You're going out, you're saying, all right, I'm gonna hit this API, it gets me close to the data I need, but it's not exactly it. Uh, and so you're able to go grab that from those providers and you're paying for access. So every time you want to read data or use data, you have to pay again to get it. Um, this works great if you're starting out, you're trying to do a little MVP of a product, maybe you have a simple DAP front end, cool. Um, but as you're, if you're building a product, it gets more complex. Usually you want, say, historical data. You want that data more usable for your product, more specialized. And these solutions aren't that. They're data plays, not infrastructure plays. Uh, and that, that's kind of where we saw the need in the market. Yeah, and I think that is maybe less uh, crypto centric, right? Like you're not the yeah. owner of data that you you receive. It's all yeah, reselling and for every call I'm, I'm paying. Um, and I think I, I would want to add something else, like more as a single data analyst, like working with various crypto products on this, is that because it's reselling, um, every company has like specific APIs for specific data points, um, but they have assumptions of like what you as a user need or you as a business need. And th the weird thing is like, unless I'm looking at raw data, um, 
I never found a good match. Like, like, oh, this is the, exactly the date I'm looking for. I had to compare like five or ten of them. And I was always disappointed because I either had to call like three of them for the complete set. And still, I didn't fully understand if it would be a matching set. Like, that's what you only understand after you've you've paid or, or pulled all the data, which is is some work in itself so i think that's how i found the the indexing company because that was one of my struggles um and i thought like hey couldn't this this be different where i i ask the data provider like hey this is what i need um and and then they just give me that uh instead of trying to go through all these documentations and trying all these these api endpoints um and uh, yeah, like maybe a shout out to some of these other data providers. Please improve your documentation. Uh, <laughs> that's that's been uh, uh, definitely a hassle in some moments. Um, yeah, so so that that there's some kind of mismatch in, in maybe demand and offering. And um, I think one of the other things that might be less um for you as the indexing company but i think because there's like less structured data in essence i think eventually people will have to form opinions on like how to aggregate that or what the data actually means and one of my favorite things on on, on crypto twitter is when two of these data analysts start like arguing a little bit about like what like you use this data point and this you use this one and you inter interpret it this way and it's not because i i love the um, um the arguing but it's more like because of that we can understand like the different data definitions uh and also like maybe get to a better definition and um I think that's part of that aggregation process, like talking to a company, like what does this mean? But I think it's also important that um, it's fine to have a different definition as long as you know where the data is, is coming from. Yeah, I think that's a great call out, honestly. Um, like if we if we pull on a specific example that, that like we've seen with our customers, um, looking at NFT trails or traits, um, they might want to know the aggregate volume that's been sold of a given NFT collection. Sounds like a really standard answer or question, right? But when you dig into it, OpenSea, for instance, removes wash trades from their total volume. What is a wash trade? That's open to interpretation. And so just those little nuances and trying to, trying to get to an answer that makes the most sense for the business that's what's really difficult. And I think, yeah, existing data providers by selling APIs to what they're trying to standardize uh, just doesn't quite meet that, meet that need. Yeah, yeah. And I think even for like the users of more the processed data sets, um, like think about something uh, Nansen or, or Token Terminal, like they, they should be aware of those definitions. So also the documentation is, is something that I often go to, like what does this, this KPI or data point actually mean? Um, but it's, it's great like to have these discussions, to have sparring partners on that topic. Uh, so you can provide like your end customer as like a data business, uh, a more valuable metric or a better dashboard. Um, so, uh, but I think that that's, that will, that space will only expand and expand where people really have an opinion on the data, but also represent it in better ways or let users choose like, Hey, we have two definitions. Uh, you pick the one that works for you, uh, or you think is most valuable for your business or for your trading. Um, and you know, we'll make, give you the most growth or we'll grow your portfolio best. So, um, yeah, I think that that's where a very exciting time is for for crypto, where these metrics are getting better and better um, uh, because we have those uh, discussions and people actively thinking about this. Uh, and eventually, we'll get to points where people agree on some standards that, like, okay, this is superior as a definition. So, um, I think that that is a good intro to like what's then your um opinion and like what does the indexing company do and how do they interact with uh companies or uh, individuals or uh funds or like 
yeah, maybe we should start with like, what do you offer? And then we can go into like, who are your customers typically? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, we do indexing as a service, infrastructure as a service. Um, I'm trying to think of us as like a Heroku or an AWS or blockchain, if you will. Um, and so what that practically means is we have a data pipeline that's fully computable. And there's three main things that we let customers define. One is what data. So they can pick on-chain data, off-chain data, cross-chain, private data sets, wherever the data is, they get to define that. Uh, two, they get to define their own business logic. So these are the transformations, everything from simple field remappings to uh, pipeline aggregations, all the way to letting them write their own custom code that then runs within our infrastructure. So they can control what is happening to the data itself, as well as what data it is. And then third, they get to define where all this data ends up. So we are not a data company, we're just infrastructure. We don't want to control it in, in any aspect of this. And so in most cases, we end up writing all this data to the customer's database. And so what that really means is they're defining their own data schemas. They're defining what type of database, data warehouse, data stream, whatever it is, they get to pick what makes the most sense for their business. Uh, and then we're just helping flow that data through. Uh, so at the end of the day, we, yeah, we're not uh, gatekeeping anything. We're, we're charging based on the amount of data that we're processing. And so once that data is delivered, it's the customers, they get to keep it, they get to use it. Yeah, and I think that's that's the important flip here to um, to your offering. That's, that's definitely different. Like the data is uh, in the user's hands, but also like the user can define um, what they actually want to see and how, how those calculations are, are being done, which I think you, um, uh, you mentioned a little bit, but, but that makes you a very important, um, or your team actually very important in helping them guide them to that process. And, um, I think one of the, the people like what I like about data science is that it's, uh, a, a continuous process where you keep iterating until you have the data or you have the, the findings you want. Uh, but it's always a continuous discussion. And um, I think in some people's minds, it's like, oh, it's a science. So eventually you should have some statement or an endpoint. But before you get there, there's probably a few iterations on the data set, on the processing, uh, on the rules. Um, so um yeah it's it's probably not hand holding um uh, but it's like guiding the the people in the process uh, whether that's from just writing the code to to get to that data but also probably challenging the business or the data um analyst or engineer on the company side where um yeah, like like how they should look at this data. What what's your view on that? On, on like performing that data analysis cycle and going through that with a customer? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of what you're alluding to is because the space is so so nuanced and so new. Nobody is an expert in any of this, frankly, because there's nothing to be an expert in. It's all brand new, um, and so. Yeah, for us, we definitely try to make this a very uh, almost collaborative process with the infrastructure and being able to iterate quickly. Um, and so this is why when we built this out, we try to make it very configurable so that the user, the, the data analyst in this case, could experiment. And be like, all right, I want to try this. Does this look like what I'm expecting? All right, give me a data set for the last 24 hours, last week. And they can get these results back in minutes. And so it gives them a really nice way to start iterating on that logic, starting to understand what they need and want out of the data. Because uh, frankly, nobody knows upfront what they need or what it's supposed to look like. You really kind of have to get a feel for it in these early stages of, of crypto. Yeah, yeah. And um I think we, we, we should make a little bit more more visual like what such a, a company eventually 
does with that data, like after this process and after you've gone through that cycle. So could you give yeah. a few examples of where your data is being used? Because maybe even some of your your customers um, are being used um, by by a listener. Like maybe they recognize some some of these brands and they actually have seen. Well, it's not your data, but yes. <laughs> your work through that data. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so a few of our, our Lighthouse customers right now, we've got Once Upon, it was a cross-chain block explorer in the EVM space. Um, I believe they currently serve 18 different chains. And so for them, they've written their entire uh, own internal custom transformation library that runs within the index and co-infrastructure and is all delivered to their database. So they control it end to end. We handle all the complexities of blockchain and the data pipelining. Uh, another one is Bello. So they do NFT analytics. They've got very visual dashboards around project insights, uh, kind of the creator economy. So being able to understand, all right, I, as an artist, I have these projects within these projects. Uh, these are my holders. These are what my holders hold. So trying to start like getting insights into your user base from that angle. Uh, and then a, a third we always like to highlight is Woven. They're doing a kind of a, almost a Shopify experience for digital artists. And so they've, they've been doing uh, same purchasing of physical prints and goods based off of the, the holding of a digital asset. So these to be NFT artists that are now selling a print, for instance. Uh, and they're they're doing this, I think, across five different chains at the moment. And so we help them with with their data as well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Especially because it's such a wide range from like more pure block viewing and like per transaction yep. to, I think, uh, I know the Bello product uh, best from these uh, like aggregated. And I actually really like what they do is that they abstract away like all these single transactions, but they do actual recommendations like what should your next mint yeah. look like uh in terms of holders community and even pricing um uh, which is i think a, a very high level aggregate and i think we will see more of those tools so uh, um yeah if you haven't checked out bellow i think that's a, a great way to see like hey how can raw data being be, be aggregated to something very very useful um yeah and and i think this already gives quite a good um, understanding of some of the customers, but I think there might be some other use case. So, so maybe um, what would you like to see uh, being yeah. built by, by customers and, and could be done on your data that you, you haven't mentioned? Yeah, so uh, just some of the more of the, the conversations that are ongoing with potential customers. Uh, we're seeing traction in spaces like uh, tracking more, more DeFi project related applications. So being able to track token sales, aggregating those maybe cross chain, understanding even swap logic to get get real time price feeds for, for data and doing this all in a trustless way, I think is part of it as well. So not having to lean on a centralized exchange or a third party to indicate this is the price for this token, um, really trying to get that information directly off chain uh, to inform say investment decisions or uh, even just business decisions on which chains to put their product on. So that's, that's kind of one whole area. Another that we're seeing is, uh, I, did, I guess Block Explorers is continuing to, to expand a little bit. There's some really cool innovation happening there, frankly, uh, where it's no longer just Etherscan, uh, where you're getting all the like hit in the face with all this raw data, people are really innovating there and, and coming up with some very cool visual ways to make sense of the data. So understanding, hey, this transaction was a swap or this transaction was a sell of an NFT, um, and even leveling up beyond that and being able to say, all right, this transaction uh, updated, say a forecaster post. I'm gonna pull in that post off chain. So being able to intermix that data uh, and getting those those more useful insights based off of what's happening on chain and really treating the on chain piece as just a marker or a breadcrumb for a bigger picture. Yeah, and I think that's also what I, I like 
about the more current uh, analytic platforms is that when they combine uh, different sources that not only the on-chain data, but also the off-chain one, because the, the blockchain is basically just the settlement layer for these transactions. And it's just a confirmation that the, the transaction was pushed through, like some value was being transact transacted or uh, somebody signed their identity, but it doesn't give the full picture. I think for the full picture, you will still need to go to like web two like tools uh, or, or data providers, or you have the data yourself, right? Like I think one of the, the more interesting uh, spaces is the web three growth space where they're really mixing up that data. They're looking at like what has a user done on the blockchain, but also what have they done on the website or what have they done in the in our shop, for example. So that's like, I think one of the misconceptions about like the blockchain is the new internet is that everything will live on the blockchain. Uh, we don't want that. Like the blockchain is super expensive to put all the data on. Um, and, and for a lot of data, it just doesn't make sense to have all these verification layers and like that confirmation from all these nodes. Well, it's not that important. Um, unless you think it's important, well, then you can upgrade it to a blockchain. Right. Um, so yeah, combining that data, um, like the off-chain with the on-chain, I think that's uh, also super interesting uh, here. So maybe I think there is an example you want to give there uh, where you see a very good use case where like, yeah, this is actually where on-chain data is definitely not enough but the off-chain data gives that full picture yeah one i like to go back to that we're not really seeing rolled out yet um, to be frank but uh, health records so <laughs> there's obviously a lot of compliance and security and privacy concerns with individuals health records um, and so the records themselves you probably don't want out in a public space even if they are encrypted it's just too much of a risk uh, that being said, you could keep a decentralized identity or the access controls to those records on chain. So there, there could be ways that, uh, say, a hospital is able to be granted access to an individual's health records through an on-chain transaction, uh, but the records themselves live off-chain. So I think I think that's kind of a, a classic example where the two the two worlds can really work together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's where probably the CK tech will, will come into play yep. where you you verify like, hey, this is this is actual a document, although you can see the document, but you know, we all now know this is the document you're looking for, and then can just show it to the ones that have that uh, that access and, and exactly. we want that. And I actually I actually saw um I think this is like years back and it was more of a, I, I think it was a good idea, but way too early where they actually did something like this. And they added also like insurance companies uh, to that. Yeah. And I think people are always like super afraid about um, insurance companies getting their data. And that's absolutely right. But in some cases, those companies actually need that data, uh, especially in an aggregate, like, hey, what's what's going on here, uh, which I think in, a, in some ways could actually improve pricing and, and be more fair to people. So I think in this project, they built some uh, query system where the, um, the insurance providers could query all the data but they could never see a single data point. It was all always ensured within the rules, within the tech that there would be a minimum amount of data points and you could never back that, track that to single users. So um, I think that's uh, definitely a unique case, uh, but yeah, access control is, is also some, some really great uh, feature, but uh, yeah, like uh, that all requires pooling um, data from more traditional systems, especially, I think, very well um, uh, secured systems like banking yep. systems, health records. These systems are like ancient in some ways. I, I, th I think like some of them are running on, on Fortran. Maybe you can, you know, that language. I think it's a super yeah. old language. Yep. Nobody understands that. Maybe like the, the 60 year old <laughs> developer in the back. But um, 
yeah, but still, you, you can still pull the data now in a new system in a trustless and like verified way. So uh, maybe we, you know, can can save these systems yes. <laughs> uh, by by bringing them into this this new DAC. Yeah. Well, and part of that too is I think the the promise of decentralized data, if you will. I'm uh, probably digging into that. It's not about having data on chain. It's having it. Uh, accessible by whoever owns the data uh, and, and being accessible in a distributed way. So there's lots of ways to accomplish that without having to put a transaction on chain and go through all the verification steps, as you were saying. Um, you can do it with different incentive mechanisms and, and different types of peer-to-peer -peer networks. Yeah, well, and that like begs the question, like how decentralized is the indexing company, and and if not, why not? Or <laughs> do you want to go there? Yeah. Um, no, great question. Uh, to be honest, yeah, we want to be decentralized, but we wanted to serve our customers first. So we started with a, a centralized uh, infrastructure that is at least internally distributed. Um, so what this really means is we're building out internally. Uh, kind of the primitives that can be decentralized. So we have a distributed network of nodes. We're working on kind of some innovations around distributed queuing, which is a, a whole problem space of its own. Uh, and then also distributed data storage. So you look at projects like Arweave, where they're, they're really working on that permanent data storage. But it's, it's slow for an application to use, let's say, a database. So we're working on, on different ways to make that happen. Uh, and as we're building this out internally, we're all building it in a way that will be decentralized in the future. Um, and really the goal here is everybody should be able to run what we're going to call an indexing node. So you should be able to go from your phone and be indexing data in the background without even realizing it. I'm just kind of creating this massive network of peer-to-peer -peer data access uh, and processing uh, is, is kind of what we're after. That's that's awesome, ID. Um... And I think that um, a lot of projects go for like a decentralization route too fast or mention they are decentralized because they have a governance token out and then run a DAO and then realize like, hey, but there's no customer or nobody's responsible for understanding this customer or serving them. So yeah, I, I like the idea more of like progressive decentralization. Like you, you start as a centralized business, see where there is demand, tweak a product, see what the edge cases there are, because there's always a lot of exceptions. Um, and then part by part, you, you start to build some decentralization into that. Also to make, I think, the company more robust for like outside attack factors or... Um, yeah, the, hopefully it doesn't happen, but the members like leaving or something else happens to them so they, they, they can't um, continue to work uh, so that anybody can um, continue with, with what you've built. Um, I think that will eventually build a much more robust company, make it more future, future proof. Um, whether that's then a company or a DAO or a company serving a DAO, like that, that's all different flavors. Um, but uh, yeah, we've seen too much project launch decentralized and then doing some kind of theater to act like they're decentralized, but they're really not. So um, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's let's call it what it is. <laughs> That's exactly it. Like we, our goal and our mission is helping other Web3 companies build better products. And so if decentralization isn't helping that right now, there's not a point for us to do it. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're not trying to shoehorn a token. Nobody wants that. Uh, we're just trying to keep it simple and really address the, the core problems that the space has. Yeah, yeah. And I think we have a good idea of like what the problems are right now and what, what you're, you're solving for right now. But, you know, it's the start of the year. So we, we want to look forward and maybe even for like the other years after. Uh, like what will, will your predictions be like how data is being used in crypto or where does it come from? Like my, my personal prediction is that it we just started where it uh, it will get only more wild and wild in the different types of data, especially because you have 
uh, like normally we had like these EVM type chains and they're quite similar, um, but with more L1s like Sui, Aptos, Solana, and, and there will be even more exotic ones coming up. These have, these have different data structures or just ways how they, they um, provide that data even to indexers. Um, and then there's like applications will live cross chain. So that's where all the aggregation of that data will eventually be super important. Um, so I think those are some areas that I, I can think of where uh, the, the data um, companies will, will have to play a huge role to keep all this stuff together and understandable. Um, but yeah, wondering what your predictions are, like uh, where will be uh, interesting areas? Uh, what would you like to solve? Yeah, yeah. I quick call it. I, I love that term, exotic chains. So that's that's a fun way to think about it. I I think it's exactly that. We're not gonna see. We're still too early for real standards. Like I, I think it's clear that a Ethereum is a winner and the EVM is a winner in this space as far as uh, data structures and processing on chain transactions. Uh, but I don't think it'll be the only one. And I, I think that's net positive for the ecosystem in that we can choose which chains and which technologies to build on top of that best fit our products and our use cases. And I think a lot of what that leads into then is hybrid data models. So it might be that we're seeing more cross-chain use cases, especially intermixing incompatible chains. So it might be that you're uh, a new DEX platform that's able to operate on Solana because of the speed and throughput, but you want the, the verifiability of Ethereum for your user identity. Maybe we can interplay the two. Uh, and I think alongside that, we're going to continue to see, especially as Web2 companies come into the space, they're not gonna just wanna dump their pre-existing data sets on chain. I think we're going to continue to see that hybrid as well. Uh, and we're kind of already seeing it with Web3 Social, for instance, where the, the user action might trigger a transaction on chain, but maybe they're posting content and that content itself is living off chain somewhere. And so that, that tie, I think we'll continue to see more and more frequently. Um, all rolling up into, yeah, really complex hybrid data use cases that, that make the most sense for a business at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, I spoke to, to a founder this week who was, was building a game and they were even thinking about like, hey, the, the game itself has to live on a very secure chain because then it can be tampered with. But we also want to write the data somewhere so people can see the results yeah. and analyze that. So like in such a use case, you already are working with two different chains. And it might even be that those different chains are so different in structure, um, although it's still the same application. And yep. um, yeah, I think th then I think the idea of like what's really off chain will also be a little bit like yep. less clear because maybe off chain will still be some people running 20 nodes like on their own server cluster. Uh, and and maybe four outside of that, like, is that really decentralized? No, probably not. But it's also on a chain. Uh, so um, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think as long as there's like an RPC endpoint for you, that's fine. Or an API for you, that's yep. fine to to call, right? Um, yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, I think that that brings us like to the to the end of of the podcast. Is there is there something still that you you know want to uh, could, could take away for for twenty twenty four about like what you want to see uh, being built or how data analysts should look at this space? Yeah, I guess on the first question. Uh... I see more consumer applications. Like we, we're still in the space, myself included, I'll admit it. Uh, we're all building infrastructure. I want to see people building actual applications that real end users can use without even knowing anything about the blockchain. I want to see more of that. Um, and then I think for data analysts, kind of tying all this back together, uh, I think it'll be important to not be niched down into a particular ecosystem. So I, 
feel like we see a lot of companies at least that are maybe entirely EVM focused or entirely focused on Solana or Aptos or whatever it might be. I think we really need to start treating this as a holistic ecosystem um, and looking at it through that lens. Uh, and so trying to be not necessarily experts, but being able to play in all those different sandboxes simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good call. Um, if, you know, somebody's listened to this conversation and they want to either follow you on Twitter or want to get in contact because they have a, a specific data need, uh, how can they reach out to you and the index company? Yeah, yeah. I mean, A, please do. Would love to chat um, or if we can be helpful in any way. Yeah, would love to. Our website is indexing.co.co. Uh, and then my personal Twitter is at R U N N I N Y E T I. So at running, running Yeti. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. Awesome. Yeah, let's keep that data conversation going uh, because I think that's the only way we can push this space and actually the usage of the blockchain technology uh, further. So, uh, thank you for coming on, Brock. It was a great conversation on data. Uh, yeah. I love having these uh, as a data analyst. So um, thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So this was another Deus Ex podcast. Uh, thank you for listening. And please follow and subscribe uh, to keep updated on next episodes. Thanks for tuning in to the Deus Ex podcast a place where some of the most progressive and innovative builders, thought leaders, and traders in the crypto space come together to discuss all areas of the crypto industry. Whether you're into DeFi, Layer 1s, Layer 2s, NFTs, or anything in between, we've got you covered. And as a reminder, nothing said on this podcast should be construed as financial advice or as a solicitation to buy or sell any digital asset or security. The comments, views, and opinions expressed by the hosts or guests on the podcast are their own. As always, you'll need to do your own research.